addition to investigating outbreaks and developing surveillance tools and protocols, she is coordinating the Northwest Center for Foodborne Outbreak Management, Epidemiology, and Surveillance, an integrated food safety center for excellence. Her research interests include infectious diseases, disease surveillance, molecular epidemiology, and public health infor informatics, particularly the design of outbreak investigation templates and data systems. Here to discuss how environmental sa sampling solved the salmonella mystery in Oregon, please welcome Hillary Duke. So the itinerary today, we're mostly going to be talking about salmonella. Salmonella, for those of you that, that don't know, is a bacterium. Uh, we think that there are an estimated 1.2 million cases of salmonella in the United States every year. This translates also into about 450 deaths and 830 outbreaks. In Oregon, we see about 13 salmonella outbreaks per year that we solve, and probably another 20 to 30 that we never solve, and they're called clusters, but that's another topic. So for salmonella, if you're experiencing that, you're having something like diarrhea, and maybe probably fever, and you might have uh, abdominal cramping. This is gonna happen about 12 to 72 hours from your actual exposure to the bacterium to when you start seeing symptoms. So, we're going to talk about a 2010 salmonella serotype branderup investigation that happened in Oregon. And it is important for me to note that most of these slides and all of the photographs come from the late great Dr. Bill Keen. We're going to talk about epidemiologic methodology and hypothesis generation. We're going to talk about a case control study that we did. We're going to talk about environmental health methodology and what we call in the field brute force hypothesis testing. We're going to talk about sampling at the firm where the outbreak was uh, generating and how that helped solve the mystery. And we're also going to talk about the resolution of the outbreak. So uh, this happened starting in October 2009. We had a first case followed by another case in November. And then cases really just kept piling up uh, really until we got to May. Uh, and we had about 17 cases all scattered up and down. What you can tell is the I-5 corridor. So uh, geographic, uh, temporal, uh, geographic location that we had going on here let us know that this was a cluster only happening in Oregon, and we thought that it must be a product that was unique to Oregonians. So we had 17 salmonella render up cases in eight different counties in Oregon, and these cases were all indistinguishable by molecular testing. The microbiologist in the room would want me to point out to you that this means Molecular testing in this case means pulsed field gel electrophoresis, or PFGE. And uh, what you sometimes hear people refer to this as a DNA fingerprint, but they're not, getting, uh, they're not getting it exactly right because a fingerprint on a human being is unique. These are cases that have a similar fingerprint, so it kind of negates the term. But what we call that is indistinguishable from each other by molecular pattern. So when we had these 17 cases, we conducted 14 hypothesis generating interviews. We call these shotgun interviews. It's a crude term a little bit because what we're talking about is shooting out a lot of hits and hoping to get a connection on at least one or two. This is a shot of some of the sections of our questionnaire. It's a little hard to see from the back. But what you can tell probably is that there are a lot of questions here. This is just the dairy section that I'm looking at. And these are just our questions about milk and then raw milk. Um, so we had conducted 14 of these interviews with 17 of our cases. 100% of them reported pet or other animal contact. 94% of them reported exposure to milk, apples, and cereal, which is pretty common. Most people are reporting exposures like that in the seven days before they got sick. Um, we're asking them these questions about uh, all kinds of foods and animal exposures, and then over 75% of them are telling us that they had bananas and peanut butter and 2% milk. All of these are very common items that are difficult to test uh, statistically for association with cases. So this is what we call an epi curve, and this gives you an idea of how our cases were starting to stack up. What you see along the bottom here is the week of onset beginning in October and going all the way into June. And uh, each one of these yellow squares represents a case. You can see how it played out over time. It was kind of a trickling of cases that came in. It really wasn't happening all at once. And that kind of deepened the mystery for our team. So uh, this is just a shot to tell you what the demographics are looking like for our cases. 
Sometimes you're seeing a larger age range than you would normally see in this outbreak. In this instance, our median age was 13 and a half years old, which is pretty young. Uh, so that's a middle school age child. And we had some cases on the further end of the spectrum that were a little bit older, but most of our cases were children in this outbreak. This is a shot of how they broke down uh, in different age and sex groups. You can see that it's just about an even split as far as overall cases with male and female, but some of the age groups drift on either side. So what are the results from our shotgun interviews as we proceed? Well, we finally got to 17 interviews completed and 100% of them reported pasteurized milk exposure. The background rate for pasteurized milk exposure is 92% in Oregon. And so it wasn't that far off from what you would expect to see, but it was still all of our cases telling us that they had consumed pasteurized milk. They had different brands, different sources, and different types of milk, like skim or 1% or whole. Um, as we went forward, there was nothing else suggestive as we continued our interviews, and 17 is quite a few cases and a lot of interviews to pull data from. So uh, we kept going, and by the time we get to August, we have even more cases and we have even more geographic distribution. Uh, what happened at this point was we decided to do a little brainstorming session in our office. We called together all of the epidemiologists that work together on foodborne disease out outbreak investigations and we said, hey, we need to put our heads together. Uh, no idea is going to be laughed at. What do we do here? And when we emerged from this meeting, we all came to the conclusion that we had several high, high frequency food exposure items like milk, and bananas and cereals, and we needed to do a case control study in addition to the interviews we had already conducted. So once we did our case control study, um, we asked people about milk in general, and this table is letting you know that up here we have the number of cases who drank milk and the number of cases who didn't, and then our controls, people who weren't sick, who drank milk, there were 44 of those, and seven who didn't. So this is telling us that a little bit more, um, a little bit more evidence, but not a statistical association. Our odds ratio, which is the measure of association with the statistical test, was undefined and it was not significant. But when we asked people specifically about whether they drank Umqua brand milk, we got a different result. You'll see here that fewer of our controls ended up drinking Umqua brand milk than our cases, and this gave us still an undefined odds ratio because this is a very high frequency item and it's difficult to get a statistical association in that situation. But it did tell us down here, this is our p-value, it's .001, which means that it's statistically significant. And so we needed to follow up on this lead with Umqua brand milk. So we got in touch with the firm and we made arrangements to go out to the plant and conduct some sampling to see what was going on. We didn't know if it was the milk itself or if there was something else that was happening for contamination. These are all the different products that Umqua was selling as far as just milk. Uh, they had, as you'll see here, they were producing milk for Dutch Brothers, for Dairy Queen, and also for Market of Choice under their own brand names. So that was confounding our evidence as we were going and making it a little bit harder to trace back. But once we reached out to the firm and realized that they were producing for these other companies, it helped solve our mystery overall. And by the way, if any of you are ever in the Portland area, we have an outbreak museum with all of these on display for you to see. <laughs> we also have a website called outbreakmuseum.com and you're welcome to visit it. You'll see some of these pictures there. So here's a shot of the outside of the facility. What you want to pay attention to as I go through these pictures are the, these crates, these orange crates and the line that they use going all across the plant as they move through and they're used for different purposes among distribution. Here's a shot of a very proud dairy man, and he should have been because it ended up not really being uh, anything implicated with the specific milk that he was producing here. <laughs> and that's the plot twist to this story. Um, but what this shows you is what it looks like inside a USDA inspected dairy facility. You're not getting at that milk. It's very well protected in there. And it goes through a pasteurization process that has been time tested for decades. And uh, really, we were very skeptical that we were going to get positive milk out of this. This is a shot of what it looks like when the milk is bottled. As you can tell, it's an automated process. Here are the empty jugs waiting to get filled and some of the inspectors. Here's a shot, and this will become important as we go, 
of the outside area. This right here, this gentleman, is bringing in milk from the outside to be bottled and sold and distributed, or distributed and sold. And uh, you can see in the background there, there's some crates waiting for him to be uh, filling them up. And here's a shot of one of our epidemiologists underneath the crane, um, the crate distribution system inside the facility taking an environmental sample. There's one from the floor drain. We always do the floor drains. They tell you where the dirt is. Here's one, any area that looks like it has condensation collecting or it's leaking, a great idea to do a sample there. Here's outside on top of the facility as the crates go over all of the different buildings and the different areas. You can see that they're open to the air and that might be a problem. Uh, we're, if we have sort of gunk collecting on the floor, we're swabbing it, we love to test it. So here's a shot of what we got back from our uh, initial sampling results. After consulting with our microbiology friends, uh, we worked with the Oregon Department of Agriculture. We partnered with a private firm that did pro bono testing for the public health department and ended up testing uh, hundreds of samples for us pro bono. And what we got out of this was the Oregon Department of Agriculture testing milk and other environmental samples had zero positives and 44 negatives. The Institute of Environmental Health had five positive hits for salmonella and they had 83 negative samples. That's a pretty low rate of positive. Um, the positives came from one crate, so one of those orange crates moving around, one floor drain, and three sites along that crate conveyor system that I talked about. So here's a shot of what that looks like. This is the facility at Umpqua here. And these guys down here, these are trucks. These are trucks that deliver the milk. I'm sorry, these are trucks that pick up the crates. I'm sorry, getting a little flustered. As you'll see, these are where the crates live and they're stored, and as people are dropping them off, the crates are getting up on the conveyor system, and they're going through a sanitization process here. That's all outdoors and on the roof of the facility. Then they're going into the facility, and they're getting uh, bottled, pasteurized milk is put in the crates, and they're being transferred down to a refrigeration facility over here, and once they're ordered and ready for shipment, they get loaded on the trucks and they leave the facility again. So all along this green line here, you have opportunity for external environmental contamination. And here's a shot. We went back for a second trip. Now that we knew that the crates and the conveyor system were at the heart of the problem, we decided to do focus sampling to see if we could pinpoint exactly what we thought would be happening. Here's a shot of all of the crates after they pulled them. This is when they had emptied the entire facility and realized that they had to now re-sanitize every single crate in the building and they couldn't use their existing system. Here's us doing some more shots. This is that sanitizing system that was in the yellow box on my mat back there. And you can see the chute where the crates would go down in to be sanitized. Here's a good shot of us sampling underneath. Not super clean under there, but it's outside. Here's another one on the inside. There's a nice shot of a whole bunch of gunk, um, some of which would later test positive for salmonella. So it sort of begs the question, and this is one that we have to leave unanswered, but uh, salmonella brand rep is commonly associated with cattle. So could this be um, people washing trucks off in the area where they're dropping off the milk and having it aerosolized? Or salmonella is also common among birds. Could birds be defecating into the system after the crates are sanitized? And those are unanswered questions at this point in the investigation, but we did get positive samples from the outdoor system. Here's another shot. These are some of the wheels that turn it. This is a great long shot of how it works here. There are several systems where they should be going through to get sanitized. But as you'll see here, when they exit, they go right out into the open air again. So uh, here's another shot of where the crate system is. As it goes into, here's the track down here. Um, these crates are moving all through the facility in, in a mostly automated way. We got samples uh, that were positive all along this track area. Here's the refrigeration system where they ultimately end up. You can see that same track down here. And it is bringing them to their ultimate refrigeration destination. And then they'll be shipped out on the trucks for sale. Here's some of our investigators. We took samples from inside the crates, and we even sampled the actual cartons this time. 
Uh, we suspected at this point, and we were ultimately right, that the milk itself was not contaminated. It was the actual outside of the cartons that people were handling and either pouring themselves a drink, or in the case of many middle school age children, taking an individual milk carton and putting it right to their lips. So ultimately, we, we collected 230 additional samples, and uh, eight or 3.5% uh, of them were positive. Uh, this is one of nine crates that were sampled, five of 36 samples along the conveyor system, and two of 19 actual milk containers were positive for salmonella. All of the milk samples were negative. Here's a shot of what it looks like after the recall. They had to pull all of their products, but the silver lining is that because it was the outside of the container and not the actual milk themselves, they were able to partner with other local dairies to produce their products and not go out of business while they were working on cleaning their facility. So here's our final <clears throat> epidemic curve. And here's the shot of when the recall happened. And this is our final case here. So it's great evidence to say that this is what happened. These are the reasons people were getting sick and we were able to stop it. So just some pro tips as we go. Um, if you're going to be doing sampling, it's important to keep some of your materials in stock so you can go out right away. If you're doing scat testing or environmental swabbing, consult with the literature, consult with people that are doing this work, and figure out what the best way is to get clean samples that you can use as evidence. If you're going to be sampling, take more samples. More is better because it's a numbers game. It's a, it's a small rate that you're going to get a percent of positive. So the more samples you take, the more positives you're likely to find. Um, Preprint your labels before you go out in the field. People don't think about this, but it's so much faster if you do it that way. And also, you might want to recruit an on-site tracker. That might be me, I can tell you. <laughs> so um, you also want to make sure you coordinate with your laboratory, depending on how you're setting this up, so you get advice from the experts about what your methods should be, including media and collection materials. And you want to think outside the box. Here are some shots of Dr. Keene doing just that. You might want to swab a rafter to see if some dust went up. That sample would later be positive for E. coli 0157. Uh, you might want to do some water collection. This is a shot out at Blue Lake. You might want to do. Uh, you might want to take apart a sink and get a drain swab that'll give you a mycobacterium positive. Uh, or you might even just swab your shoes. Uh, but you might want to think outside of the box when you're doing sampling. Think of areas that other people might miss. It doesn't really cost too much. It's an individual sample, but you want to be creative when you do it. And that's the moral to this story. And I want to thank you. So, I will be here during the networking luncheon. If there's anyone that's interested in talking more about public health informatics or about microbiology, um, I believe Dustin is here to tell, hopefully for the networking lunch too, microbiologist expert there. Uh, but I, I hope that some people are, uh, if you haven't heard about public health before, consider it as a possible option. We do some really great mission-driven work, and you can do cool things like swab milk cartons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so are there any questions for me? Yeah. You mentioned uh, other uh, bacteria that you might also be detecting. So when you go in and do a specific study, you, you had reports that there's salmonella. Um, are you actively checking for other bacteria as well, or do you have to focus on the salmonella because of the issue at hand? How do you decide what to do? That's an excellent question, and I think it's really topical right now because we're kind of moving into this era where we're really considering multi-pathogen infections that people are having. I think historically, you know, we've sort of had this idea, uh, and Dustin, jump in if you feel differently, but even with microbiology, you kind of have this sort of one colony pick where you're looking for one bug, and you may or may not look for another depending on the way that the order is set up, or the request comes in from the person making the order telling you what they want you to look for. But, um, you know, I think we have seen uh, people in recent days, I can tell you, reported to the health department that have multiple infections. And I think it's just driving us to say, you know, maybe we, do, we can do a little bit more as we go in sort of exploring what other kinds of bugs might be in the mix when they're, when they're doing that kind of lab work. But I, I can only really talk about it as a layperson because that's not really my field. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah? Uh, so, thanks. so you had said uh, more, sampling, more sampling is better. Uh, 
<laughs> more sampling, more sampling is better. Is better. Yeah. Um, and 230 samples sounds like a lot of samples, but that's an enormous facility. Yeah. Um, and much like yourself, I'm sure I, I love data. And so how do you keep from sampling thousands of mm -hmm. times over this huge facility? Well, you try to be targeted with it. So just like you're saying, data really is what drove the way that we decided to do this. You know, you can kind of take it to the 10,000 foot level and, you know, people will get reported to the health department and they have a pretty fixed idea of what made them sick and they might try to get you to test their food. But if you don't really have any data pointing you towards it, you have to be kind of judicious with what you're going to be testing. And you have to be ready to deal with what you find if you get a positive result. Uh, but for this instance, you know, we went in and just kind of did, I think we did about a total of 130 samples the first time that we went out there. Um, and it was difficult to decide, sort of, you can't do as in-depth in every area as you want to do. So you try to do kind of a representative sample and take them from different areas and keep track of the specific areas where you're taking the sample. And then if you're lucky enough to get a positive in any of those areas, then you go back in and do targeted focus all over that area sampling so you can make sure that you're getting sort of the full picture of contamination in, in whatever mm -hmm. event is happening. Have any of the samples for any other salmonella and serotypes? Not that I know of. I think that we have had situations in the yeah. past with outbreaks uh, where we've had multiple serotypes, but uh, not in this one. I'm thinking about one we had, <laughs> you'll like this, it's a multi pathogen example. So there was an outbreak of veggie booty. Do you ever remember that yeah. uh, product? It's now oh, yeah. called Pirate Booty Veggie Flavor. They did a little reboot, did they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After they got busted for making little kids sick. Um, and so the first serotype that we were investigating was Salmonella Wandsworth. But when they actually tested it, they went a little bit further and they found three additional serotypes of Salmonella. So four serotypes of Salmonella on this product that was marketed to children ultimately. And it was from raw vegetables that had been sprayed on it. And they thought that there was a kill stuff, but there wasn't. They were just grinding up raw broccoli and kale and just spraying it right up and stuff. So, you know, the, the more contaminated the produce, uh, the more likely you are to see multiple serotypes. I do wonder if we, if we pressed it far enough. I'm not really sure. I think for all the cases that came in, they were all brander up. But it's not the first outbreak. If, you know, there are many outbreaks where we'll receive multiple serotypes coming in because there's some kind of multiple contamination happening, whether it's from a raw product ingredient or some other kind of environmental contaminant. Because yeah, it seems like if it was from the bird droppings, you would have had multiple strains. Yeah, and so I like Brander up more for cows. Source. Yeah, I think I think we we have, it, it has been, uh, I don't know specifically if Brander up has been associated with outbreaks of birds in the past, I, but I know it's definitely been associated with outbreaks of cattle. Yeah. Okay, one more back there. Yeah. I'll talk about so how many how many of these cases do you typically get a year that you would going to go out and investigate? In Oregon? Yeah, yeah. Uh, your department. How many so I think we get somewhere around 500 to 600, depending on the year. Wow. Not all of them get this in-depth of an investigation, I would say. So the process looks like they get reported to the health department, and each county health department is responsible for investigating their case. And once they get them reported, they have a standardized questionnaire that they all get asked about, which is some high-level food, animal, water, and uh, person exposures that we ask them about. And then we do molecular testing. And the lab is really driving a lot of what we do to detect the relatedness between these cases. Sometimes it'll be obvious and they'll have eaten, say, at the same restaurant, and then we're on that, and we don't have to wait for molecular subtyping. But a lot of the time what we're doing is waiting for the lab to come back and tell us, hey, these two cases have a pattern that's indistinguishable. And that tells us that the DNA for that particular bug that they isolated from those patients is similar, and we should be looking for what they have in common. So not everybody moves to that second level of matching someone else. Um, we estimate that for every one confirmed case that we see, there are 30 unconfirmed cases out in the community that are probably related to it. Um, so, so that kind of gives you an idea for um, a bunch of people that may not actually get tested, that may have the same exposure, but we never hear about them. So we're unable, we're unable to uh, launch an outbreak investigation to look at their connected exposures. Yeah. On average, how long does it oh, take? Last one. Last one. On average, how long does it take 
to do most investigations? Oh, well, as you can see, this one went on for a really long time. We're talking from November to August. Um, it's a success story because we figured it out, but it's also a little bit of a failure because it took us so long to do it. Um, some outbreaks are solved in maybe two weeks. Others go on for months as we wait for cases that are more spread out in time, so it just kind of matters. So it depends on the situation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.